Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our our uh, session on, on getting hearing aids, what you need to know. This is part one of a three-part presentation. Each part is about an hour, uh, a little more, a little less, depending upon the content. And uh, then we'll have an opportunity for questions. Um, we are having just a bit of a, uh, a PowerPoint problem. And so I don't get to see the presenter's view, but I only see the slides that you see, which is fine as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I've done this enough that I have a bit of a feel for it. So before we go on, I can't see all of the people who are here. So if you can identify yourselves, uh, that would be great. Um, I can go to a gallery view and I get a few people and I see myself, which I don't need to see. And I see uh, Bob and Trudy, this Flocum are with us, Bruce Nelson. And Mike, Mike's the newbie, right? How are you doing, Mike? I'm good. It's been a while. It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's good to see you. And there's Art. He always comes to these 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 meetings. And I'm always glad to have him here. His presence is so appreciated. And he provides good feedback as well. Let's see who else is here. And Dan and Fred. So we have a lot of regulars and one new person. And hi to Dan and hi to Fred. Um, so we'll just get started with this. I'm going to minimize the thumbnail. So um, uh, they'll be at the bottom of the screen. And I no longer can see anybody, uh, which uh, is going to be a little inconvenient, but we'll just go with it because we're having some tech problems. So as you can see, the name of our talk is Getting Hearing Aids, What You Need to Know. And uh, most people have been here so many times, they, they know the drill, there's not much new. But Mike, this, some of this might be of interest to you. And uh, let's go to the next slide and we'll see what comes up. And this is a program of the Rochester chapter of the Hearing Loss Association of America, which is a, uh, a program designed for individuals with hearing loss. It's consumer-based. Our goals are to provide an education uh, component, act as a resource, and just general information for individuals with hearing loss. Our chapter is remarkable. It's a very exceptional chapter. Uh, we hold uh, several programs of this chapter for people with hearing loss. And we have a number of other programs which include a very high quality and well-maintained website, which contains uh, membership information as well. Um, and we have a monthly educational and informational session on various topics and a very popular, every once in a while, ask the audiologist. And uh, this always brings a lot of people in and we feature audiologists in different practices in our region. Both sessions, which are ordinarily on the first Tuesday of each month, which is run by me and it's a chance for people with hearing loss to share their experiences about their hearing loss and their hearing aids in an informal discussion format, moderated by me, as I said. The last one, we got talking about the different brands of hearing aids and, and people's different experiences with them. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, on the third Thursday of the month at now 12 o'clock, uh, we have a, demo, a virtual demonstration center, which reaches out all over the entire country. And this is for people who have an advanced hearing loss, really, and an interest in uh, looking at what else can be done in addition to just using a uh, standalone hearing aid. It's very, 
informational, very, very well done. Can't say enough about it. Um, we have an annual featured speaker program, which is always given by individuals of national prominence in relation to hearing loss, hearing aids, and related matters. A cochlear implant group uh, for individuals who have implants or are thinking about getting one. And this happens on a quarterly basis. A monthly newsletter and you can become a member for only $10. Um, and you can do this just by going to the website and learn what's involved. Advantages, batteries are extraordinarily inexpensive uh, through our um, association. Um, about these sessions, each, each session is scheduled for one to one and a half hours. And this, uh, this covers important things about uh, a hearing loss and hearing aids. And as I say, it includes a question and answer session. The sessions are recorded, so you know. Um, and um, the questions and answers are not recorded in order to pursue a, a policy of privacy and confidentiality for the participants. You can access these sessions through our website. Uh, it's, it's very easy to follow the uh, links. Well done. So this, this, this is what it's going to be about today. Uh, it's my opinion that there's probably nothing harder to buy than a hearing aid. They have high cost. There's no brand recognition. There's always a concern for new users if hearing aids are going to work for them or not. Um, so it's a very, very difficult thing to, to, to navigate for individuals looking into hearing aids. They don't know where to go, who to see. Um, the purpose of this series then is to provide assistance through the very difficult early stages of getting hearing aids. As I said, we've broken down into uh, three sessions. The first one is the important part about getting hearing aids, things you need to know. The second session is primarily about understanding the audiogram and you know, I try to get an idea of what you're grappling with. The third session is reasonable expectations, uh, which you can expect. And we talked th about this a little bit in the second one, which is based on the experience, our experiences of a large number of people in our practice. I recorded data on probably eight, 900, if not more people over the years. About me, you need to know who I am. I'm a retired audiologist with an ABD status. That means all but dissertation towards a PhD. I was a former director of audiology at a community hearing and speech center for about 20 years. I've worn hearing aids for about 25 years, maybe more now. Um, I've been in, I was in private practice for 24 years. As a hearing aid audiologist, I had two primary interests, um, a hearing aid candidacy, what makes a good candidate and how to identify them, a good candidate and hearing aid fitting outcomes. And I presented a lot on this at various meetings throughout the country. And uh, also I've listened to or used um, every hearing aid we dispensed, except for the high power instruments. Um, I have over 20 articles and research papers on hearing aids and related issues at the international, national and state levels. My approach to the hearing aid issue is it includes the, uh, several assumptions. Number one, of course, as we've said, hearing aids are very expensive. I wanted to bring down the cost. I had a chance to do that twice, and I won't go into that now, um, but it turned out that that just wasn't possible. 
Uh, I know, knew that people are fearful, some people are at least, about getting hearing aids, as we said, because of their high cost, the reputation for not working well and winding up in the drawer. And because people, many, some people, not all perhaps, go into this with an expectation of problems and failure. So this is what kind of guided my principles for my practice. The other aspect was that users don't know what's normal and what isn't normal and what they should put up with and what they shouldn't have to put up with. Um, I also assume that if there are problems that sometimes users don't really know if it's something they're doing, if it's their hearing loss, are, are, are they unique? Uh, is it their hearing aid? Or if it's just the way it's fit or set, it's, it's very complex for a, a user to find out really what's going on. They tend not to follow up very well either. They wonder if they're being too critical. Is it going to cost me more? And that's a real concern, I think, for many people. Um, are they being unreasonable? And then there's always a human nature aspect. Oh, geez, just let it go. The darn things don't work anyways. I can't be bothered. It's not worth it, this kind of thing. Um, before we go on, I have a disclaimer. And that is what you're going to hear from me is views that are really pertain only to my practice. And that's because I had control over it and the way I chose to implement it. We all know in life that if you talk to 10 or 15 people about any topic for advice, you are likely to receive 10 or 15 different approaches to the same topic. And we all know that. Um, this is true for hearing aids and hearing aid fittings protocol, hearing aid fitting protocols also. Man, there's a lot of religious beliefs here on the part of providers. I know the way to do it. Uh, and I certainly fall into that category myself. It is unlikely, therefore, that you find anyone who would agree with everything I'm saying, or even many or uh, most things. It, it's all so individualized. You can only go with the outcome, results. That tells you how well you're doing. So my approach to hearing aids was we engaged in active follow-up, an active follow-up model. It was our assumption uh, that we needed to do everything we could to assure that the user was doing well and without problems that could be avoided. So to that end, we followed up after almost every visit, either by a phone call or email, or return visits if the problems appeared complex flex enough, or if I felt the user really didn't grasp yet what we were trying to do and what he or she needed to do. Let's talk a little bit about hearing loss so we understand terms here and, and really what we're dealing with. When it comes to hearing loss, you can think in terms of effective listening distance. That is how far out can somebody with normal hearing hear a softly spoken voice? The criteria standard was 20 feet, just like in vision. And someone with normal hearing should be able to hear a soft voice at a distance of 20 feet without straining or without difficulty in a good listening situation. As you can see from the chart, a mild hearing loss reduces that effective listening distance. And a moderate loss reduces it even more. Uh, a severe, you have to be within three to five feet with a speaker using a loud voice. And of course, uh, a profound is very, very close, a very loud voice of three to one foot or less, maybe right up next to the ear. And a deafness, there is a smearing of, 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 of reality here, but it's generally considered to be 
at 90 to 95 decibels and is signified by no usable hearing for the purpose of speech communication. Before we go on, because we're talking about getting hearing aids and there's gonna be a lot to cover before we get to that really, the number one thing to keep in mind is that when we're thinking, someone's thinking about getting hearing aids, the provider is the most important part of the whole process. And I know so many decisions are cost driven and I can understand that, be that as it may. These things are so uh, complex. I don't wanna really use that word, but there's so many things involved that you've gotta have a good provider and you've gotta have somebody you're comfortable working with. This is because hearing aids are not simple listening devices. They're not like an earphone or a, 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 an earpiece or anything like that, which are, passive amplifiers. All they're doing is presenting highly processed sounds to your ear. Hearing aids don't have that luxury. You, it's rare to have somebody put on a hearing aid, walk out the door and never have to come back. I'll bet you I can count all the people that I remember in that stage or with that uh, situation on fingers one hand. And I polled my colleagues many years ago about that. And virtually everyone said, oh, perhaps only one or two percent can get by without assistance. And it's not because of level of hearing, it's because of the fact that there's so many factors involved. So you don't put a hearing aid on, walk out the door. Instead, what you're doing is you're entering, hopefully, into a long-term relationship that can go on for 20 years or more. And the next thing to remember is that don't ever respond to an ad offering the latest and greatest technology or 50% off. I tell you right now, there is no such thing as 50% off or never respond to the ad that says a national expert is gonna tell you what you need. Uh, and you can just count on it. Uh, I need to make a point. They're there to sell hearing aids. And I certainly don't know the normal situation, but I do know of one or two quite well. And I don't know if this exemplifies the situation or not, but these people will take 20% right off the top of what you spend. And they keep that. That's their part of it. Sometimes the provider who does all of the work might get eight to 10%. Uh, so that's a part of the deal. And some institutions or some companies will charge a $500 per hearing aid trial fee. That means most people are walking out the door with $1,000 lost, no matter what happens. So I'd be very, very careful about these kinds of approach. Let's talk about normal hearing now. Pretty interesting stuff. It covers a very wide range of intensity from minus 10 decibels, that's relative to human hearing, the norm, all the way down to 120 decibels, which is exceedingly loud. Anything beyond 120 decibels and maybe even 120 decibels enters into the range of physical discomfort and possibly even pain, reaching the pain threshold. A lot of that depends on your, the status of your ear, health of your ear, whether or not you've got a hearing loss. Uh, you can see on the chart that the, most of the speech sounds are around the 25 to maybe 60 dB level. And the voice sounds over on the left side of the heavy line are the vowel sounds or voiced consonants like Z and V and E, O, A, L, U, E, I, and what have you, J. So they're loud, they're powerful. They're usually pretty easy to hear. 
On the right hand side are the challenging sounds. Here you have the P, H, the G, and the K, and uh, um, the soft consonants all the way down to 20 dB. So you can see by looking at the chart that there's a 35 decibel range between the softest consonant and the loudest vowel sound, voiced sound. That's huge. Along with us is that most hearing losses are of the high frequency nature. So not only do you have most of the hearing loss where the softest sounds are, your hearing is good where the louder, louder sounds, sounds are. are. And, and you, you know, know what? what? That, that fools, fools people because they still have a sense of normal loudness, but they're just not hearing it clearly. As such, there's often a lot of displacement and projection. Individuals saying people don't speak as clearly as they used to, you're mumbling, et cetera, when in fact the other party is not. Try to move forward here and I'm having a little trouble doing that. I can't advance my slide for some reason. I don't know why that's happening. So over here, there we go. Um, let's assume somebody has a flat hearing loss, just it's flat all the way across the audiogram. And it's pretty severe. The task then is to take that full range of audibility, okay? And squeeze that down into a very narrow range. Now, looking at this example here, you can see that the, the difference in loudness between the various sounds is, is quite reduced, isn't it? It's not nearly as large as it used to be. So things never sound the same when you're wearing a hearing aid. And you have to keep in mind that we always have to be careful of that maximum loudness factor we don't want sounds to get anywhere near 120 dB. So what we're actually doing is compressing the range of normal hearing into a much narrower range. Now, this is my audiogram. I'm a pretty typical, somewhat advanced hearing aid user individual. The lows are quite good. And the, how, the highs are down to 65 or 70. And, I think this was, um, oh, in 1918 or so. I'm sorry, 2018, not 1918. <laughs> uh, so uh, you can see that the highs are down. It's worse now, I'm sure I can tell it. And, and then notice all the, uh, uh, the, uh, the sounds of speech. And I just don't get the T. K, F, S, and TH without help, even with help, I really don't get to hear everything as clearly as I would like without hearing aids. With hearing aids, it makes a huge difference, but I still struggle with F, S, and TH at times. So there's a lot of confusion for me. Um, the circles are the right ear, X's are the left. The triangles are the results with uh, the average norm for individuals who are between the age, my age, of 80 to 87 years. This is from a study in Holland, but I think it's very exemplative of what else is, is going on. Um, so I think it just gives you a pretty good indication. I'll draw your attention to the small, to the values up on top. You see the, the percent for frequency for intelligibility at 2,000 and 4,000. So you got 56% of intelligibility for the very highest frequencies where hearing is generally the poorest. That's a real sledgehammer for people with hearing and hearing loss. Uh, and I think most people don't realize how critical those two frequency bands are for just understanding everyday conversation. So when you're talking about the audiogram, there's three things you need to know. One is the severity. How far down on the grid are you? And that's what was shown in the previous slide. The configuration, 
the pattern of the hearing loss, as we said, most often it's a high frequency. Sometimes it's very abrupt, and in rarer occasions it's rising. So everybody's hearing can be different. That's why it's so hard to judge from one person to the other. And then word recognition score. There's other factors, but these are the three primary ones. You can also use findings on an audiogram. Word recognition means how clearly are the sounds perceived by the ear. And you want to think of that kind of like there, there, there's distortion, inherent distortion in the ear of everything you hear. That means a hearing aid cannot really clarify that well for the user. And even if they get a hearing aid, although they're going to hear a whole lot better, Things may never be as clear as they want for individuals who have a difficulty with word recognition. We'll talk more about that in one of the future talks. So just realizing that these three components, severity, configuration, and word, word recognition for us, can give you an idea of how, of how complex uh, hearing loss and hearing aid use really is a lot more than most people think. Um, so, uh, a, a little bit more on the audiogram. As we've said, some configurations make it much more difficult to use amplification, especially sharply falling audiograms, and some of them are really quite precipitous. Or a sawtooth or a peak. Audiogram. It's hard to find the sweet spot for individuals with this type of hearing loss. Um, the degree of severity, and as we said, the word recognition for the speech frequencies. We touched on this basically. Uh, what what we've learned to do is to average the hearing thresholds at 500, 1,000. 2,000 and 4,000. Um, and the average value of those four frequency bands gives you a very good indication of the degree of hearing loss. And it's an overall indicator of the level of hearing. And you will find that on most audiograms. We'll talk about that in the next talk. As we said, word recognition. Joe, we're having some bandwidth. There. Okay. There you um, go. Okay. I got a message. Um, although on, on, on rare occasion, as we started to say, the, uh, uh, the loudness of the test words can be too low. And we'll talk more later on about hair cells. I think you'll find that to be very interesting. As we said, hearing aids are not simple listening devices. And let's just talk a little bit about them. They are actually miniature public address systems. They have a microphone, an amplifier, and a speaker or a receiver, the component where the sound comes out of. Um, they serve a wide variety of functions. They're actually a real-time listening device. They do help with telephones. They help with assistive listening devices, and we'll touch on that briefly in one of the future talks and so on. They, they actually do a lot of things, and they're expected to perform 
out to I 20 don't feet. Know about every bird on travel with the sound, it seems to be broken up there. Okay, now, now, Fred, I didn't quite understand what you were saying. Um, well, you know, I'm so, yes. Are, several of us are having bandwidth problems on the internet. It's it's really slow. The other oh. thing I know is we lost your PowerPoint. Your share screen went out. Oh my goodness. And that's a that's indicative of bandwidth problems. It, you should be able to restart it though. Okay. Now how do I go about that, Chaz? Go back we, down to the bottom of the screen where it says share screen and click on that green button. Okay, see, I, I, I don't have that. Um, I just had the PowerPoint slide. No, I mean down, down at the uh, control panel for Zoom, down at the bottom strip. Across yeah, I don't know, have that. You don't, do you have anything down there? I, I, I put my thumbnails all the way down so they were out of the way, but other than that, I only, and I don't see, I don't really see them. And I can't activate it. Okay. You well, know what? I see your clock. That's a, <laughs> a little bit of your clock. That's about it. Yeah. Uh, wiggle oh, your mouse. Let me go to a, I'll go to escape. Okay. Yeah. There. Okay. So, okay. So now I don't have any of the Zoom features. And it looks like Fred wants to come in. So let's admit yeah, him. Yeah. He lost okay. internet connection as well. Boy, oh boy. Okay, so here I'm, I'll call up Zoom, I've got you. And, but you don't have the controls across the bottom. I okay. do not. I have a theory. Um, at the very top of the screen, does it still say screen sharing? The very, very top of the Zoom uh, window. Uh, it says slideshow. Oh, okay. So are you looking at PowerPoint? I am looking at PowerPoint and you are a thumbnail. Okay. But you don't see any of the other Zoom windows? No. Now I have two Zoom windows open. I'll try the other one. Nope. No, didn't do no. anything. Um, take the thumbnail that, can you see me in a thumbnail? Uh, yeah. Just go over it and double click on it and see if it expands it. Well, I double clicked it and I got back to where I was. So I'll single, no. What we're trying to do is get the controls back at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Sometimes the controls are on the top of the machine. That's the funny. That's why I, I asked him to look at the top is if you float your mouse all the way up to the margin at the top, see if they open up. Well, I can the, pull, yeah. What do you see? I'm able to pull down the, uh, the top bar for the PowerPoint presentation. And I see underneath that, I see a box that says Zoom, enter email and, and password. Okay, let me see I, what I can see. And then uh, I can see other other documents that I have open, and I thought I've closed. And okay, we we have a choice here. What we can try to do, and it's up to you. You can just continue without the visuals, or the other thing you can do is get out of Zoom and come back in the way you did originally. Well, maybe that would be best, right? So. Yeah. I mean, I'm in some kind of a loop here. I don't well, know what's see, going on with my I computer. So before. once you lose that bandwidth and you lose screen sharing, some of the other functions of Zoom stop operating. Oh, okay. I agree with Chaz. Okay, so I'll just close out of Zoom. Just go down and at the bottom. Well, here's the catch. Do you you can't you can't get out of Zoom because you can't see the menu, right? <laughs> okay hold well on actually second. you're right yeah hold on a second okay you may need to update your zoom version <clears throat> yeah hang on okay Chris, uh, 
Alt F4 on Zoom and it'll kill the process. Yeah. Did, did you hear what Bruce said? No, I didn't. Uh, no, alternate F4. On your keyboard, the Alt. Yeah. Hold that down and up at the top, click on F4. Oh, okay. Alt F4. Okay. It should do it. Nothing is happening at all. Yeah. Wait, it's really hard. Um, uh, my my concern is if I click on I can remove you, but it may not let you back in again. <laughs> That's right. Okay, what we're gonna do, Joe? Can you still hear me, Joe? Okay, on the keyboard, have you ever done a control alt delete? before do you know where those keys are all three of them at the same time you should see a dialog box and hopefully it has a list of all the programs that are running yeah i can't hear you now it's it's completely hung what we want to do is, is see if Zoom is listed as one of the processes running. Click on that and then the button that says end process. Is it technology ah, wonderful? Found it. <laughs> Sorry, folks. We had bandwidth problems yesterday, too. I don't know what's going on. Now let's hope he can find the email so he can get back in. Charlie, he may need to update his own version. Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't communicate with him to tell him what he what he did once he gets unfortunately once he joins the meeting you can't run update i know that, okay if it happens again that's probably what the problem is yeah especially when you lose all your controls and everything right goes away on you. and that happened right in the middle of a meeting <laughs> yes about, about 40 minutes in okay i'm back and we can hear you. Yeah, right, good. Um, what we may have to do, and it, it may not be something you can do now, Joe, but we need to update your Zoom version, but I don't wanna do that. We might be okay for the balance of the meeting. See if you get your controls back at the bottom. I have them all back. Okay, click on the green share screen button and see if PowerPoint is still a choice. It is. Okay, let's see if we can get it back. Okay, I'm looking for part one. I have part two, part three, maybe this is part one, okay. Boy, I got so much junk open here. I don't know if you can see my screen or not. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, should I go back to from the beginning? Uh, well, you can scroll down the thumbnails and click on where you left off. Oh. If you can see which one. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty much, I opened right back up to that spot. Okay, then click on from current slide. Let's see what happens. Okay. We'll go. So I have my, my current slide and the thumbnails over to the right. Let's hope that it holds and then we'll get back to you later about updating. Okay. I'm sorry about all this. I thought I did do an update that, that they. Uh, you may have. We'll, we'll look into it though. Okay. All right. So we talked about um, how much things do, how many different things hearing aids do. They function in a wide variety of situations, up close, at distances with one person, 
multiple people, multiple environments, in quiet, in noise, at sporting events, and the performances, although I don't particularly like them for rock concerts. Um, they are miniature, dynamic, electronic devices that are worn in the body or on the body, which of course are subject to body chemistry, moisture, normal wear and tear. And they have a very, very limited power supply. This is critical. I don't think, I don't think many people, especially new people realize that. And this is a very important and limiting factor and what hearing aids can do for people. Um, and they function over a wide variety of environments, winter, summer, dry weather, wet weather, what have you. Um, and another observation I made is that they're probably, possibly the most used item I own. I don't think I use anything else as much as I use my hearing aids. 12 to 16 hours a day, every day, 365 days a year, year after year after year. Right now, I'm on about seven, eight years with my current set of hearing aids. That's, that's an awful lot of use I've gotten out of one single device uh, or a pair of devices. That's really impressive. It's more than your car. The only thing that might come close to it is your refrigerator, um, but it's not as it's, you know it's not in the same environment that your hearing aids are. And the other thing is you always have to keep in mind with hearing aids is they do not have the advantage of favorable microphone placement. In other words, they're, the mics are right up here on top of your ear. And microphones by their nature are always going to pick up the loudest and the closest thing the best. So if there's a sound that's louder than the sound you want to hear, guess what the, you're going to hear better? The louder one. Or if the, there's a sound between you and the sound you want to hear, guess what you're going to hear? The closer one. It's just the nature of things. Now, there's a lot of advantages now with the new processing, and it's getting, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> better and better every day. But still, these are just inherent limitations that can be difficult to overcome. And we talked about it briefly. <clears throat> they have a limited power supply. If people want to walk around with huge apparatus for processing of sounds and it, it would be a lot easier to provide better quality sounds. By and large, I think they do a marvelous job. And usually they function in the presence of noise of some sort. At home, in the store, at weddings, they're about the worst. Restaurants, worship, in an infinitely wide variety of acoustic environments and situations. And they do a lot of things I think that most people don't realize. They're a lot more complicated than we might think at first. Um, they're also very different from smartphones, Walkman or iPod or headsets or TV listeners or other, other listening devices. As we touched on briefly before, these devices <clears throat> are passive amplifiers. They don't have to process raw signals. Everything they pass on is pre-recorded or processed in a sound studio uh, <clears throat> or through a sound studio. The microphones are always placed very close to the source of the signal, right at the mouth or on the lapel of, of the person that we're listening to. And every single thing goes through some sort of audio engineer who is able to modify what you're actually hearing. And they're able to balance all of the various inputs so that they're all equally intelligible. And um, they have multiple input channels. So there's one for this party, one for that party, one for this, and, you know, and they're all mixed in at the mixing board. 
your hearing aids don't have that opportunity, that advantage. They're doing that in real time by themselves with less than ideal by far microphone placement. And of course, in most of the process sounds you hear, there's no background noise, is there? Or if there is, it's at a very low level, it's left there by design. So, but set so that it wouldn't ordinarily interfere with intelligibility. Uh, some of the, the features of hearing aids, they make sounds louder, just like your earbud does or your smartphone. They're, which are easy and inexpensive to do with your items that you get, your, your cell phone. I have never, ever gone back to my cell phone provider and say, I can't hear well. You need to adjust this. You need to make this louder. I don't know how to use it, this kind of thing. It's, they're a lot simpler. Um, they control loudness output. So everything you hear is provided in theory at your comfortable listening levels. If you don't have that, something is wrong. Go see your provider. Um, it, you know, it's very, very inexpensive to make soft sounds louder, yeah, it's a piece of cake. I remember doing that in one of the labs I took. Uh, it was very easy to make with a resistor and all the other components and a power supply and, a, and an output source, but it is very hard to make sounds louder, but not too loud. And to make them louder, but not too loud at specific frequencies. So your hearing aids, they, they're just remarkable things because they expand the soft sounds. Then they just knock over the louder sounds and they just keep doing that. So it's to maintain the increasing sounds in the environment within that limited range of hearing that they have to work. And they do that without harming or hurting the ear if they're well set and uh, if things are in place like they should be. Um, so I don't think anybody realizes all the good things that they're doing. Um, and they have, most of them nowadays have a noise reduction feature. Now that doesn't mean that they get rid of the noise, but they can knock sounds that aren't directly in front of you down by three, five dB, maybe six. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it makes a big difference. They are very critical and they're very important. And almost all hearing aids come with this kind of, of a feature now. <clears throat> As we said, they take the range of sounds out there in the environment that are like this and then bring them into the um, user's range of residual hearing. And as such, you can see, it's easy to see that there's so much more complex than earphones or iPods or other ear level devices. Something about what the circuits do. We've touched on some of it. They expand the sound. They compress it so it's not too loud. They have multi-channel functions, sometimes upwards of 20 channels. Each channel, it's not like a graphic equalizer, although that's one of its function. Each one can be separately set for this expansion characteristic and the, and the compression characteristics. Uh, they're really complex. And we've said they all have noise management reduction. And they speak to each other. They send a radio signal back and forth to help optimize your listening situation and actually make a decision on what sounds you wanna hear and which ones you don't wanna hear. It's not perfect. Does it help? Yeah, all the time? Nope, but it's better than it was. And they allow you to leave the ear unplugged without having feedback. And this is a major advancement in the newer hearing aids. Um, now, in my case, my hearing loss in the highs is severe enough. I need to have a fully occluded ear canal so that we can trap the highs in the ear canal and I can get to make the fine distinctions. And other aspects of, of having the ear plugged can be manipulated, modified by setting some of the parameters of the hearing aids. So that's not uncomfortable to listen to. <clears throat> and as we said, they have feedback suppression and just a lot of other things too. 
Here's something about the, the newer circuits of, of the newer hearing aids, which I just uh, looked up the other day just to see what was going on. Um, this is from the provider page of a major manufacturer's uh, data sheet or discussion about their new products. Um, as we've said before, they have a self-contained power supply. As users, we don't think that's a big deal. Don't think much of it. It's huge, especially when you consider all the processing that hearing aids are doing today. And they have they are able to take raw signals and analyze it, process it 56,000 times a second. I, I, I can't wrap my mind around that. I don't know what it means. I, I can't process it. I can't imagine it. I've heard it for a long time, although with lower numbers, it started out in the 20s and 30s, it was the sampling times rates. Now it's up to 56,000 times a second for each sound that it's hearing. It's mind boggling. And I can never evaluate that. I can only evaluate how it works at the end when everything's all aggregated together. And they are also at the same time, 100 times a second, sampling your environment for what the hearing aids need to do in order to optimize your listening signal as has been defined by your provider and your preferences. <clears throat> and they rebalance the auditory input of the individual sounds. And it, it switches the attention between the various acoustic sounds in your environment. It does use clues as to the nature of the sounds to help it make these decisions. And they have extremely fast noise reduction, extremely fast. They can actually remove noise between words. And um, they can be adjusted also for simple or for complex listening environments. And they just do that automatically. So talk about getting hearing aids. We already said there's probably nothing harder to buy. And in review, high cost coupled with the idea the hearing aids don't work. There's no brand recognition. Who knows where to go? Do you just go to a big box store? The prices are lower. Bingo, bango, you're going to hear better. Or do you go on mail order or online? Do you go to a franchise? You know, one of the brand names, Miracle Ear is the one that's most well known. Here, USA, et cetera. Who knows? Or do you go to a commercial dispenser? There are very few independent commercial dispensers any longer. So there's one or two in town here. And I think they're really quite good. Um, but they're not on the same level, to be quite honest with you, as an audiologist, um, who are more highly trained. And there's a, you're already, from the starting gate, there's really high biases against hearing aids. They're cost. Everybody's ripping me off. These dealers, these audiologists, they're just in it for the money. Huge margin. And they don't work anyways. They're not worth it. I have good friends who will not get hearing aids because they just don't think they're the value that uh, is being asked for. They're just too much. They think of the simple Walkman or other headphone things you can get. Sometimes you read things and they say, negotiate your price. Nah, you don't negotiate price. You know, probably if you go see an audiologist, it's like going to your physician or your dentist. I don't negotiate the price of my dental fillings or my crowns. He makes a whole or she makes a whole wide variety of decisions about what's best for my tooth and my mouth. And it says it's going to cost this much. Bingo, bango, that's it. Uh, it. It just, that's the way it's done. And audiologists kind of operate on the same model. Uh, there's always, there's sometimes thinking that if you get the really best instruments and pay a whole lot of money, you're going to solve every problem. Well, that's never happens and it's never going to. It's just too complex of an issue. Keep in mind, as we said before, 
that when somebody gets a hearing aid, they're not buying a device for the latest technology. Instead, they're entering into a long-term relationship with a provider, possibly for the rest of their life, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. I had some of the same people in practice for almost the entire time I was in practice, full 20 years. And you know what? You cherish these relationships with your, 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 your patients and I think the feeling is mutual. Um, the disadvantage of the franchise brand particularly, and I think perhaps the big box stores is, you buy devices and you have to go back there for service and maintenance because the software is proprietary. So no one else can have access to it. Even though you're looking at the hearing aid, you say this one's made by Phonak. This one's made by Siemens. This one's made by Oticon. You can't get into it. The, 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 the software locks you out of it, the proprietary aspect of it. So you're very limited. If you don't like the provider or you change your mind, you need more service and you want to go to somebody closer to where you live, you can't do that. And the staff usually is more transient than at an audiology practice. You never know who you're going to see. Um, just a reminder, the provider is the most important factor for success. Never respond to a splashy ad. It's all hype. There's, they're, 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 they have good advertising agencies, which make good ads, but that doesn't mean that where you're going is going to be a good place. Uh, never go see the national expert as we talked about earlier. You never see that person again. And there are no major hearing aid breakthroughs ever. There was a lot of advertising about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, about this new hearing aid or that new hearing aid, walk into any room, all your problems are solved. No, that's not the case. There's no breakthrough. There are little increments. And if there's a new improvement somewhere within a year or so, everybody's got the same new technology. Um, really what counts is knowing what to do with your hearing aid and you know how to manage it. It's, it's the provider who knows what to do that makes the difference. And as we've already said, never be persuaded by the concept of latest technology or this special feature or the various buzzwords or even the number of channels. I don't think there's a provider around that can evaluate the, uh, the, the, the functionality of all the different channels. Um, nor do I, have I ever seen any data that supports that, well, 21 channels are really what you need. Uh, what you want to do instead is seek the most qualified provider. And here's a good tip. Don't go tiny. Don't try to hide it. If you do that, you're going to lose features and options. And they're so small. Nowadays, who sees them anyways? You know, I'm, I'm wearing one, as, as I've already said. And everybody who's at this meeting, I think, is wearing one. And they're so small, nobody makes a big deal out. Always, when you can, think behind the ear. There's a lot less feedback issue, which still exists. It's easier to use the controls, although it's less important if you have your smartphone control now. Um, now, the exception would be is if you have a problem with, with manipulating small things. If your fingers are numb or, you know, they're not, your hands aren't terribly functional then of course you might wanna go with, with something that goes all in your ear. But other than those exceptions, try to think of behind the ear hearing aids and stay away from tiny. It's, it, it, there's so few degrees of freedom with a really small in the canal hearing aid. Some things you always wanna get, providers nowadays will tell you that you don't need it, but stick to your guns here. Get a volume control. 
You've got to have a volume control. Uh, you never know what kind of a situation you're going to run into. If you're going to run into a soft voice that is in the, the presence of noise, and you need to boost things up just a little bit, especially young kids or individuals who are soft-spoken. Always get a T coil, a telephone coil. Now we'll talk more about that uh, in one of the upcoming sessions. And nowadays, virtually every hearing aid comes with multiple programs. So that's, uh, that's not as much of an issue as it used to be. Um, Mid-grade works best for most hearing losses. That's what we found in our practice. And it was our rule of thumb to recommend the mid-grade products unless somebody had a very severe or complex situ <laughs> excuse me, situation then we would move up to the high end and more often than not that was the better way to go and sometimes would let you know, people switch back and forth and they they could make the decision when i started out and so many of the people who came to work at the office everybody was very cost conscious and so we would try to recommend the lesser cost devices. In our long-term follow-up surveys, outcome was they never really were happy with them. They just really weren't. Initially they were because they were hearing better, but after some time and experience with them, they realized that they, were, they just weren't doing the job for them. So I, tend to think, try to avoid the lower cost hearing aids if you can. And there's uh, several tiers of hearing aid companies out there. There's three or four or five maybe major manufacturers that really come out with all the new innovations and all the top products. And then there's the second, third, and so on down the line, other tiers. Every once in a while, I don't know, perhaps you still might run into somebody who makes them in their basement or their garage. I kind of doubt that, but I, I know when I started practice, that certainly was the case. Um, you want to avoid those. Uh, stay with the top level companies if you can. Now, very often you get the lower grade products at the big box stores and some of the other in quotes discount houses. Now, I don't know if that's always true. And I shouldn't, you know, it's not a blanket statement. I just use the term very often or sometimes. Um, two hearing aids are best. That's without a doubt. And here's a very dramatic slide to demonstrate that. So you can see here, I'll just use my cursor. You can see here the, uh, uh, the black uh, a graph is uh, someone with uh, normal hearing. And you can see that in the presence of quiet, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference if you're using one hearing aid or two. And so if you're at home all the time and you're not gonna be out and about and listening in a more complex uh, situation, you can get by with one. But if you're in a more difficult listening situation, like in riding in the car, we all know that's tough, or in a store, at a restaurant, on the street, or at a party, heaven forbid, uh, weddings, uh, you're dead in the water practically with just one hearing aid. I know even with two, if I'm in a noise situation, many noise situations, I just sit there and I'm order another martini or something because I know I'm not going to be taking part of the conversation. And everybody who knows me knows that too. Of course, being of an age that I am, a lot of my friends are the same age. So we all are in the same boat and avoid those kind of environments when we can. So uh, in review, when you're getting hearing aids, you want to make sure that you see the most qualified provider. That means an audiologist. You need to have an idea of your hearing loss, the, con the degree, the configuration, and your word recognition score. Always make sure when you see somebody for hearing tests that you get a copy of the audiogram and take it with you. And 
always get a word recognition test. Have a word recognition test. If your provider doesn't do one, that is not a good provider to buy a hearing aid from. Blanket statement, fact, count on it. Take that to the bank, okay? Um, and if you're a veteran, realize that you might be eligible for services through the Veterans Administration. So in summary, I'm sorry for the interruption that we had earlier. It's, it's always dis disruptive and you lose your place and train of thought. Um, today we covered general information about hearing loss, a brief review of the audiogram. The next session will be a lot more detail on that. A little bit about hearing aids and an introduction in what you need to know about getting hearing aids. So, so that's it. Uh, in our next meeting, we'll cover more critical aspects, a full explanation of the audiogram, more on getting hearing aids, and some tips on how to evaluate your hearing aid fitting, candidacy, something on candidacy, who's likely to do well and who might have some hurdles to face, and some of the differences between the various products. So, are there any questions today? So that's it. I'll turn off the slides and uh, then we'll uh, uh, just review, just return to the normal gallery view. Actually, I won't turn them off. So that's it. Um, are, are there any questions? Do we have any new people? Only Mike, I guess, is the new one that I see. We have a very small and a very select group of people in attendance. So Mike, do you have any thoughts or comments? Sure, of course. Um, <laughs> I'm not so surprised I, at that. The first thing I have to say is I don't consider myself new, although it's certainly true. It's been a long time since I've been to an HLAA Rochester chapter meeting. Um, so the second thing I want to say is I really appreciate that you're still alive and helping us because <laughs> of, of all the, I think of all the people, you know, I, I'm most grateful for you, Joe, because you, you know, you're just very much no bullshit. Here's the straight, the straight dope. And uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Nice part, of the reason I, part of the reason I uh, attended today is because